Thank you, Dr. Chambo. Good afternoon, everybody. Bonsoir. Uh, bon tard. Okay, so that's all I can say. I can speak in my language if you want. Nangandef? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we are here today, just as we heard, and we just want to make something clear for all of us. Jesus said, I will build your church. Right? That's what he said? He said what? My church and the gates of heaven shall not prevail. Okay? So it's his church. So shall not prevail against. So it's his church. We are here to speak about Jesus' church. It's not our church, this group, or your church, it's his church. So this is a forum. We discuss together, which means that we are not supposed to just be the ones giving the answers. We have people here who are experienced also, who can also give and say the answers that can help in the building and the edifying of his church. Amen? Amen? Yes, yeah, so now... Uh, this is a time also for listening to each other, for sharing. And we hope and we know the Holy Spirit speaks through the body. And we believe he will speak to us tonight. I just want to, we received the four, already four questions. Uh, and we will just read it. And uh, open it for answers. Okay? The first one is uh, Dr. Litswele addressed the topic of worship and music coming into our church. What can change the trend and bring the songs back to theologically sound and deep? Why do churches want their sound so loud that the words are so hard to, hard to understand? Okay, could you want me to repeat? Okay. But I just want to tell you, if you have to answer, you have two minutes to give your, or to answer, or to state your question. Two minutes. So I, I, reread, I read again. Dr. Litswele addressed the topic of worship and music coming into our church. What can change the trend, that tendency, and bring the songs back to theologically sound and deep? And why do churches want their sound so loud that the words are so hard to understand? Okay, that's, that's the first question. We'll answer this question, and then we come to the next question. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Uh, my thinking is that uh, actually to address that is just to, to go to the younger uh, generation to teach them uh, our songs in the manner that uh, they grow up with those uh, attitudes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Anyone else? Yes? I think to go along with what I just heard is I would encourage that we, we look at our local church, our districts, and we set up some training with our worship leaders and those who are you know, good in theology and that and bring them together and train them because we do know that a lot of our churches, our youth are key to leading our worship. And I would probably say they've never had any type of training. So while I understand the question, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting older and my hearing's not as good, and I go into a loud service, it's not pleasant. But I also need to understand the context of what's happening there. And so I think the way I would approach it is we need to be more intentional in our districts. Let's have a worship seminar and bring in the theologians and the, the worship leaders and those youth worship leaders and say, 
let's look at this and how do we do, do it so it meets the needs in our context. Because I think a lot of what's happening is people just, our, our worship leaders, our youth, they just simply don't know about the old hymns or the other things and how we can contemporize that for today's uh, audience. Thank you. Anyone in the panel or in the group here? Yes. Uh, Davi. In the Afrikaans community, um, we have established uh, a group of people, musicians, that is currently taking all the old hymns and just uh, um, turn them into modern um, choruses using the old words. And the young people just love them. At our youth festivals, we sing them. They go crazy about them singing the old, trustful, good theology words. Thank you. That's a practical answer. Yes? Yeah. Thank you. I, thank you, Davi. I think that's the way to go. Uh, the old hymns have the theology that we don't want to miss. In fact, there is a statement that says, the one who conducts your worship informs the theology of your church. So it is important that our, our singing is theologically sound and balanced. But there are two dynamics that we need to be aware of, uh, which is what I think part of what uh, Brother Davi has just uh, uh, addressed. The fact that it's, it's, it's uh, amazing grace does not necessarily mean that it has to be sung like uh, Charles or John Wesley or whoever sang it then. We should understand that uh, the type of music that uh, young people or the people of our generation listen to. So maintain the theology, but don't create an impression that it has to be Sibaha Nizim in tune in order to be holy. But for that to happen, we, we need to also think about this. We have a, a theology behind our heads that anything that reflects the shake of my body is carnal. So when I start, it's like I'm, it's of the world. We, we, need, we, we, need, we need a balance there. There are, there are extremes on both sides. Uh, there are those who can do it to an extent that. But the fact that it's, it's African does not necessarily mean it's hidden. So we, we, we really need, I think the seminars will help to discuss such issues. That uh, music must be singable, it must be theologically sound, it must be enriching, but it's okay to be happy in the Lord, and there is time to cry in the Lord. Thank you. So, okay, yes. Muito obrigado por estas boas perguntas. Thank you for this wonderful question. A todos que estamos aqui temos apreciado o louvor e a adoração que temos tido. We, we, all of us being here, we have appreciated the time of praise and worship. E todo aquele que é nazareno sabe que efetivamente a palavra está no centro. And all of us as Nazarenes, we know that the word of God is central to everything we do. Mas reconhecemos o valor do louvor. But we also recognize the value of, uh, of, of adoration, of praise. E, e não podemos esquecer a nossa origem, somos africanos. We should not forget our, who we are, we are Africans. Alguns são origin. mais dinâmicos, outros nem por isso. Uh, the others are more dynamic. 
Nós, por exemplo, nesses dias, os cabo-verdianos, estamos a receber uma dinâmica grande. E os cabo-verdianos, estando aqui nesta vez, estão aprendendo a receber essa dinâmica de moving Quando visitarem as nossas ilhas, vão ver que não somos tão dinâmicos como o que estamos a ter aqui. Se você ir para suas ilhas, você vai perceber que eles não são tão dinâmicos em suas danças como o que vocês viram aqui. Mas estamos felizes. But we are happy. Não estamos deslocados, somos nazarenos. We are, we are not far from the, the, our identity, we are Nazarenes. O que eu penso que é fundamental, What I believe it's fundamental é que os nossos seminários e colégios no treinamento dos pastores is that uh, in our seminaries and uh, colleges where we prepare our pastors devem usar os cultos de capela we need to use the time that uh, the, the the chapel time para ensinar os nossos pastores os hinos e os coros com base teológica e que são da igreja do Nazareno including the chapel services a time when we uh, teach our students the hymns and the theology behind those hymns and all the songs that we sing. Quando nós passamos pela escola bíblica há uns anos atrás, a few years ago when we were at Bible College, era fundamental nos três, quatro anos de curso que você conhecesse o hino número um até 464. When he was at, uh, at college years ago, it was important that during those four years of studies, Uh, they would learn all the songs in our present worship from the first one to the last one, 460. E voltando para as nossas igrejas locais, nos cultos chamados de estudo bíblico, tínhamos que ensinar pelo menos um hino à congregação de cada vez. And it was a requirement that as they returned back to their local churches as pastors, they were supposed to teach at least one song. To their e quando visitarem as ilhas vão ver que todos os nossos cultos chamados cultos devocionais temos pelo menos três hinos. And as a result, in every services that they, that they have in the islands of Cape Verde, they will at least have three hymns. Isto uh, ajuda muito a doutrina. This helps in the doctrine. Mas levanta também a adoração e o louvor. But also it help us to raise our our by in our praise and worship. Então o apelo é as nossas escolas, os pastores terem treinados, porque se não sabem como fazer, será muito difícil orientarem as congregações. So our schools need to be to to take this and teach our pastors so that they will know how to help the congregation. Obrigado. Um, I just want to put one, two, three lines to what has already been said. I really love our hymnals. They are very good, theologically sound, and they have everything that we need. But in addition to intentionally teaching them, I think we also need the current theologians to also start to compose songs in order to add more to that. What we are having is only things from the 17th century, 18th century. We also want theology, songs that are coming from the 21st century. And we have got good theologians. And it, as far as I'm concerned, good messages are coming from these people. Let us also pray that the Lord will give them the art of composing new songs so that we can include them in our songs. Thank you. One, okay, I think many people want to speak about this issue, but there are many other issues that are waiting. So I think there was uh, Phil. Phil, is he here? Okay, so, so uh, one last, my brother, yeah. Thank you. And, and then Daphne, sorry, I just saw you, Daphne. Thank you, facilitator. Uh, mine is a... Uh, a piece of advice to my fellow pastors. Whenever, whenever you are planning the worship service, ensure that uh, you work with the worship leader so that you know the kind of songs that uh, will be sung uh, on Sunday. That one is very, very important. I do also know that most of the pastors who went through our theological training, uh, Bible colleges, universities, they have studied music. There is a class on Christian 
music, worship class, and uh, they understand fully um, what they're supposed to be doing. But uh, my appeal is just a simple one to the pastors. Ensure that you coordinate with the worship leader so that you know the kind of songs that will be sung in the worship service on Sunday. I used to do that as a pastor, and it helped a great deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Gumis. I think the point that I was going to say is what uh, uh, Reverend uh, Mtambo has said. But I would like to, uh, I was thinking about the board of stewards in the local church. Even before maybe we go to what uh, our brother Gary has suggested, is it possible that the board of stewards, because I think one of their responsibilities is to um, work with the, the services in the church. So uh, if they would work with the worship team, as they are being led also by the, by the pastor. That was the first thing. The second thing, I would also uh, like to suggest and also encourage us to, especially to look at the songs that have been translated into the local languages. Sometimes the translations, um, the message has not been fully uh, put across as it is in English or in other languages. So as we are looking at composing new songs, uh, may we also look at the possibility of editing uh, the, the translated songs to ensure that the message is the right one all the way across. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we see that this is a very important uh, issue. And uh, as you see, we are taking notes because that's also the goal, so that we see how we can, with our different uh, 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 members, I mean, not members, French is coming back, forms in the church, we can help the body. So what I can write as, uh, like, they're talking about training, worship seminars, turning old hymns into modern choruses, writing new songs, and uh, just one first last thing, the pastor is and should be, just like we heard with Pastor Paul, the first worship leader. He will be, should know and should train himself. He's his worship team and be, or at, at, at least be involved. Okay, now we're turning to the second question. And if you have questions, please, you can write it down and continue to just uh, 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 bring it here. For the past few years to date, the church in Africa has been losing pastors to other denominations or starting their own or were starting their own ministries. Is there anything, anything the region is doing to address this? And has the region identified what contributes to, the, to this exodus from the church? Okay, I repeat the question. For the past few years, there are many pastors who left the Church of the Nazarene and they went into other denomination or they're starting their own ministry. And the question is, is the region doing anything to address this issue or did the region, the region identify uh, the, the reasons of this exodus, like it was stated here? Okay. It's clear? I, I don't believe that uh, we have uh, clearly identified all the reasons. Um, some will tell you that... Uh, they sense God directing him in a different place. Others will be clear to the fact that uh, the structure of the church, the way it is, uh, the representative structure of the church where the church board, the membership has a, uh, input in what's happening it does not give the pastor that authority to be the man or the woman of God in charge and thus says the Lord. So we have had people say, we live because they won't take my word. Uh, they want, I, I don't believe in this whole thing of, uh, um, of the board because I am the one who has been called 
and I need to give direction to the church. Others, I think, is just uh, unhappiness with, uh, with how things are happening in their respective districts uh, and feeling like they don't have any room to grow or to develop. Others, because of uh, um, lack of uh, mentorship and coaching and some support uh, as, they, as they do their work. So there are various reasons that come, and others maybe even doctrine. Uh, that the the doctrine the doctrine of the church uh, feeling like they um, they want to be where they can speak in tongues. Yeah. I've had people say, I, "Since we don't speak in tongue, and and if you didn't know, I will say it again. Uh, in the Church of the Nazarene, we don't speak in tongues. So they will say we will go where we will we will have room to uh, to do so." Uh, so you have those doctrinal issues. However, what is being done? We don't want to take this lightly. I have, um, um, especially in, in one of the fields, I said to, uh, it's, I think it's more than one field, but one field is currently working on that. I said we need a pastor's, a pastor's meeting. We need to come together with our district superintendents and pastors to talk about these issues. Not, not the, the, the usual palcon that we do, or pastor's conference where we invite guest speakers, but the pastor's weekend where we truly, openly have a discussion and conversation about these several issues that are bothering our pastors and they, and they probably feel they don't have a place where they can ask those questions and, and find help. Um, I think one of the fields, I think if, uh, it's, uh, it's already, uh, has already identified a possible month or date um, that we might attempt to spend a, a Friday and a Saturday with, uh, with the pastors who can make it just to learn from each other because even the answers I gave might be incomplete. I know that those pastors are friends and they will have talked to the other pastors. And we don't want to keep seeing that exodus. We want to, to find a way to, to nurture and help one another as we continue to, to serve. The, the other, uh, thank you, Dr. Chambo. Uh, the other thing that uh, I have observed, which seem to be common in most of the people that I've seen uh, leaving the ministry, made me think that maybe there are commercial or financial reasons behind the exodus. Uh, and I say that because most of the ones that I have seen, they live to start their own ministry, my, my ministry. And uh, I have heard on several occasions them talking about against budgets. They want to have, they talk about against budgets and the control of the church board. They want to have direct access in the control of the finances. I say it falls under commercial, but there is the other aspect of it. I've seen the majority of them being of a, of a particular age group, which is usually towards retirement. And I have connected that to the possibility of not having an effective pension plan. That when the pastor has been underpaid or unpaid and has not been able to have his or her own house, when the biological age retirement approaches, they see themselves as homeless and penniless. When they go to start their own ministry, there will be no limitation to say at this age they must retire. So it becomes a way of securing their, their pension. Like I say, it's a theory that comes just from my observation, it has not been tested, it might not be 100% correct. Another factor, uh, we 
it's, it's in the sight of recognition when it comes, comes to our lay pastors and how we handle the whole transitional issue. We put a person as a lay pastor for 20 years and we don't encourage them to study and they start to feel like they are pastors there. Then all of a sudden, here's a minister fresh from the college. We want to remove that old man there, a lay pastor. And when we don't handle it well, then we lose that lay pastor with some of our members. Praise God for NTC, it's addressing the problem. But where, where the satellites are not functioning well, we still have problems of lay pastors who have been there at the churches. The churches, they started the churches, there were no buildings. Now the churches are sound, they can get a qualified pastor. But they still feel entitled that they are called to those churches. Then when they leave, they break away with some members. The solution is we need to strengthen our satellites so that they will provide training for those pastors who might be working and feeling that they want to study theology so that at one point they might be ordained ministers. Thank you. Uh, any more comments? Okay. So, yeah, sorry, you know, when you, because of the flight, we don't see. Okay, there is one here. We take the three last and we move on. We have like four to six questions that are waiting. Okay. So if you are saying something that has already been said, you know, but yeah, just go ahead. Thank minutes. you. I think another thing with the, with the point of the lay pastors that have been put there and then afterwards the other, the, the, the qualified. Um, I think from SDMI, it's for the first time personally I found out that actually there is this decon thing that need to be maybe strengthened in studies. There is what? De A decon. So, Okay. Yes, I, I, I okay, Thank sorry. Uh, I, I think that will help, uh, especially as we're talking about also the call. We, we are studying, John, here, the leadership in, in the spiritual leadership. I think the church, as also we were looking at the essentials, is important to make a distinction between these two, uh, those who are called uh, as pastors or elders and those also who are called as deacons. I think it will help to look into that educational wise. Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean more, more and more questions are coming so uh, we just, I will just take one more and uh, then we move so that we can address all the questions. Thank you. One more. All due respect, I uh, I'm worried, can we really call it an exodus? Or aren't we, you know, making this issue bigger than it really is? Because then we should do something, really do something about it. If it's just some people in some area that's leaving, that's another thing. Just to add something else then, um, I've lost quite a number of friends out of the ministry. But that is simply because ministry is sometimes so hard, so difficult. You know, you have to be a manager, you have to be a cleaner, you have to be a counselor, and you have to have a lot of money somewhere stacked to fund whatever you're doing. So in, in, in my view, it's not just, I, I hear what you're saying and it makes sense, but maybe just another area is that it's so hard sometimes, and, and pastors need support and encouragement and prayers and love, acknowledgement sometimes. Okay, thank you. So we stop with this question. We move to the next question. This is not a question. This is a request from Sifo Vilakati. Sipo. Okay, a request for an opportunity to make a brief statement on Nazarene Essentials. So two minutes. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Microphone. Thank you. Just to echo the comments made by others yesterday on the production of Nazarene Essentials by the BGS, we really appreciate that. But I have just one or two things which may perhaps in future improve on the document. 
One, it is important, I think, for any document to have pages. We do understand the explanation which was given yesterday, but I think it would help if the document would have pages. Secondly, it will also help to have just one page of definitions. We have uh, terms like polity, Brazilian uh, holiness, deacons, and others. It's important for people out there, particularly members of the congregation, members of the church, to understand exactly what is meant by these terms. The issue of cost was not mentioned yesterday. We are not sure whether in future this is going to cost something or it will be available gratis. Chair, the FS, of, uh, what we call them, the field strategy coordinators have been made visible in this conference. However, when we look at the document, uh, they don't seem to have prominence. That is, the missional structures don't seem to have been given prominence in the document. Yes, the governance structures are very clear, the local church district and uh, the general, but when it comes to the missional structures, it's not very clear in this document. I think maybe it would be a future edition. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, uh, appreciate those uh, um, comments I think they will help us and also the uh, uh, we will also refer some of those to the general secretary's office and general editor I would appreciate uh, if uh, if you would email us those comments because they are very important as we continue to work on the documents uh, uh, we, we will make sure that we we re revisit those uh, those issues presented Thank you. I think uh, I, have, uh, I have two questions here that they say they should be answered by me and the general secretary. So I emailed it to general secretary. This is the only time they allow me to use my computer to, to email something. One of the questions says, why does the church board have more power has more power than the pastor? Why does the church board has more power than the pastor? I think I, I, I have a problem with the word power. Because there starts your problem. When either the pastor must have power or the church board has the power. Um, the, Dr. Wilson will help us with, with some of that. But my understanding, as you read through the manual, uh, the Church of the Nazarene has a representative uh, structure in our government. So the pastor does not work in isolation or the church board in isolation. Even at the beginning of the process, when you call a pastor, there is conversation, clarity on expectations. There is a process of review of the pastor. Uh, it, it, is, it is important. There is no way the pastor can come. I cannot come and say this is the only way and expect that there should not be a, a conversation. There must be that conversation because we're working together. So I, I think we, we need to be careful that it's not the issue of who is more powerful, who has more power, but what is my role as the pastor? What has been decided by the the General Assembly, by all of us, as the guidelines of where do I fit in, and what has been decided as where the church board fits in in the in the in the work of uh, of the local church. But Dr. Wilson, I don't know if you would uh, you would help us uh, uh, with, with that. He is certainly more knowledgeable on this area. Uh, I see three more questions that I might email to you in a few minutes, though. Sure, yeah. glad to okay. help in any way I can. I would say this, that the idea that, that uh, Dr. Chambo has just expressed was one that was resonating in my heart, both as someone who has been a pastor and also the intention of the Church of the Nazarene. 
that, that power, the issue of power, is theologically and biblically untenable for us. Uh, and that we run into difficulty, as Dr. Chambo said, when that is the starting point for us to consider how things get done in the church. I would say this, if, if the concept of checks and balance means anything here, uh, the idea of accountability and a checks and balance, an accountability to each other, and that we are checking on each other, all right? That doesn't mean looking over the shoulder of one another, but it does mean that there is a shared sense of accountability with one another. Now, I believe that there are many cases when one or the other group, either the pastor or the, the, the church board, gets a sense that they should be running the show. And that is where power comes in. And in those situations, inevitably, there will be problems. There is no question. There will be problems. If either the pastor or the church board tries to control the other, there is a sense in which the church board and the pastor need to work together. The pastor has incredible influence. And... That, as one person says, is what leadership is, is influence. I find it helpful when there are major decisions to be made that I would go as a pastor, I would go to key leaders on the board and I would talk with them. I would explain my position. I would enlist their help. I would ask their encouragement rather than to say, this is how we're going to do it. Don't ask any questions encouraging discussion, encouraging conversation with your board, working with your board, and also working for your pastor, working with your pastor. Those are two key dimensions. And when those kinds of elements exist, where we are seeking to help each other, there is a great sense of balance, there's a great sense of accountability, and there's also a great sense of workability as well. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. We actually have a lot more questions, so I don't know if we will be able to answer all these questions. Okay, so now uh, we're just trying to put together the questions with the same, you know, with the same topics. So. There are questions here, like three to four of them, that are addressing the issue of the relationship between the region, the field, and the church. So I will ask uh, Dr. Chombo and Dr. Wilson to just uh, help with that, with those questions. Thank you. This is one day I chose not to have my manual with me. I had my, the manual of the church every day of this conference. Um, but, <laughs> yes. I think, thank you, and, and, and I probably Dr. Wilson has it already open where it clarifies. In our last General Assembly, uh, the church did an uh, excellent job to clarify what is, the role, um, what is the role of the region. So, in fact, if you look through the manual, you will see that we have three uh, levels of government in the church, or three governments in the, in the church of the Nazarene. The local, the district, and the general. So local, district, and general. Those are, those are the structures that, uh, uh, that, that we have. And uh, the, the regional office, the regional structure, it is there as part of the work of the general church as an administrative support to the work of the local district church and general church. We, when necessary, the general superintendents also delegate some responsibilities to the regional directors or field strategy coordinators on, issue, on jurisdictional 
matters. So it might be assemblies or it might be disciplinary issues that we are dealing with where the general superintendent can enlist the, the assistance of the, uh, of the regional director. With the regional structure, it is still impossible for the region, regional office, or just one person, the regional director, to be responsible for all the administrative issues and um, uh, jurisdictional issues that might be delegated to us from one single office. So the regional director has assistance to the regional director. The FSC is a team that assistants and work as a team with the regional director to accomplish that which was um, placed by the General Assembly in the hands of the regional structure uh, to facilitate the development of the church. The other main, most important area of the work of the region and the field is to facilitate the, the church planting work of the Church of the Nazarene, especially in the areas where the church is not yet. So we have been talking here about sending missionaries, talking about entering new areas. The region is entrusted with that responsibility as part of global mission entrusted by the general church or general assemblies you read through, uh, 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 through, uh, uh, through the, uh, the manual. Sometimes people get this confused. They will come, for example, to me and say, you need to make a call on this. And I will say, I think this is a district matter. I cannot enter into this, into this conversation if I'm not invited or mandated by the, by the general superintendent because it's a district matter. Or if someone might come with a local church matter and I will say this is a local church matter because the church respects those structures that we have. You have a pastor, you have a local church, you have a district, you have a district, uh, um, uh, district, advisory, a district advisory board and you have general board and different other areas. I will, I will ask Dr. Wilson to probably add anything you may want into, into that subject. I'll add one thing and then underscore something that you've said. Uh, the, uh, first, let me underscore what Dr. Chambo just said about the uh, authority that is given to the regional director or even to our general superintendents. It may come as a surprise to you what he just said, but there are many areas where he does not have, and the general superintendent does not have, direct authority. And for one of them to intervene in a situation that is clearly a district matter or clearly a local church matter would be inappropriate. And it would, it would transgress what our manual has laid out. And so I just wanted to underscore that because that is so very important. There are many times... When, uh, when we receive information at the Global Ministry Center and they w somebody wants a general superintendent or a regional director to take action on something that is really outside of their direct responsibility. And so we work very hard to make sure that we do not transgress those lines of authority. The second thing I would say is just something to add to the very, very fine description that Dr. Chambo just said, is that the region, neither the region nor the field is legislative. And that's why when we talk about three distinct areas, the general, the district, and the local, each one of those has legislative responsibilities. And by that, I mean there are elections. There are elective leaders that are in place. The region does not have that. The fields do not have that. There are no elections. They are not legislative. There are no policies that, that are voted on by a body, as you have on the local, on the district, or on the regional level. The purpose of the region and the purpose of the field is to help facilitate mission. I think you said that. So I just want to underscore what he said there that you, they help to facilitate mission, help to, with training, help with development, just like we're doing here. 
there is a whole lot more that can be done right here than, than trying to do it, you know, 50 times across a region or on a district. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, 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 with that question, there, was, uh, there were several questions related to this, so we won't read each one of them because we want to be fair to other questions. But the other question related to this was the fact that in the local church, we have a church board, we have a district, uh, a district advisory board, and we have a general, a general board. Uh, specifically, I believe that has to do with the fact that those are legislated, right? Uh, uh, and I, I will probably ask Dr. Wilson to speak to that just for one minute again. But with the, with the field and region, for example, we have the Regional Advisory Council. Those are, are members of the, of the general board. We can have additional members that we have that become part of advising. So the regional director does not make decisions alone, but you have a team of field strategy coordinators, the service coordinators in the Africa region. I call that a, a regional mission team that works very closely with me and the regional advisory council that work with me. But that's not a legislated it's an advisory group that is not part of the legislative group. The field strategy coordinators, they do not work alone. They have people that surround them. A lot of them spend a lot of time with district superintendents, other leaders, missionaries, discussing issues related to, uh, to the field. But we do not have a field board or a regional board. I think the most important thing that I would add to that is the issue of accountability. That way, when you have these kinds of boards, you don't have one person making all the decisions, one person trying to give all the, all the guidance. When that happens, there is oftentimes spiritual abuse, financial abuse, all different kinds of, of things that occur that are harmful to the church that are not helpful at all. And so our local boards work with pastors and help there to be accountability. Our district advisory board works with the district superintendent to help support and to be a, for there to be accountability. And the same is true with the general board and the board of general superintendents. Thank you. Thank you. And the field strategy co coordinators are held accountable the service coordinators are held accountable. There is a process of review one-on-one uh, -on -one with the regional director. Uh, we, we come and uh, give our report to, the, uh, to those representing us, to the general board, so that they are aware more of what is happening in the, in the district. But that's not a, a regional board. Just to try to answer another question that was related to... Um, uh, to, to that specific matter. Um, thank you. Okay, now, now we have more questions that we kind of did distributed to our, to our colleagues, but feel free also to give your inputs. We'll start with uh, uh, Reverend Aderetu for his question. The question is, what is the cutoff age of pastors and, and or who determine their retirement period? Okay. Esta é uma boa pergunta, porque mostra que enquanto estamos jovens, não ativos, pensamos que um dia chegamos à reforma. This is a good question, because it shows that we are, we are aware and sensitive to the fact that while we look younger today, someday we will have to retire. E Deus nos ajuda a chegar a uma idade avançada para reformar. And may God help us to reach that age of retirement. E de preferência com boas condições para terminarmos os nossos últimos dias sobre a face da terra. Uh, preferably with uh, good conditions so that as we get to the end of our lives, we, we will be comfortable. Penso que é muito mais fácil responder esta pergunta uh, de cima para baixo. I think it's easier to answer this question beginning from the top. Com os superintendentes gerais, o manual é claro, diz 
a idade em que devem passar a reforma. The, the manual is clear on when the general superintendent should retire. E com os superintendentes distritais diz que nenhum pode ser eleito ou reeleito se completar os 70 anos. And with the district superintendent it says no one should be reelected or elected as a district superintendent once they reach 70 years. Interessante que não diz nada sobre nós pastores se estivermos nas igrejas locais. Interesting enough it says nothing about pastors. Eu não sei o que é que os, os juristas haviam de dizer isto, mas a leitura que fazemos é esta. I don't know what the, the, those who read the law will say about this, but this is my interpretation. É que até 70 anos podemos estar no ativo. I, maybe it means when uh, up to 70 years we can be very active. E passar a reforma. And we retire. Agora, há uma situação interessante. Yes, uh, interesting situation. Muitos de nós estamos nos nossos países de origem em sistemas sociais que nos permitem a reforma. We, most of us, serve in countries where we have a, a age, a retirement age, and also a time when we can receive the pension. E há países em que, por exemplo, as senhoras, as mulheres, podem ir à reforma de 58 até 65. Uh, in other countries you'll find that they will say the retirement age for women is uh, 50, 58 years old to 65 they can e retire. normalmente é 62. And mostly 62. E para homens entre and, 60 e 70. And for men between um, 60 and 70. Então eu creio que podemos ficar com o número de 70 anos para pastores, porque também depois disto pode ser só fadiga e canseiro. <laughs> My opinion is that we can stay with 70 as the age of retirement because if you go beyond that you might uh, create more trouble. <laughs> Obrigado. That, that's his opinion. <laughs> ok. Uh, if you have a Do you have any question or, I mean, uh, comment? If not, we... Yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I was at District 7 then for 12 years on the Gauteng District. I think we're addressing a symptom here and not the real problem. We spoke earlier about the financial situation here. A lot of pastors cannot retire because financially they just are not able to survive. And I don't sense, and it's not an accusation, it's an observation, I don't sense that we are making any research. We talk about pastors leaving the ministry, on the other hand, maybe it might be the same reason. We should ask them the questions. While I was district superintendent, I have realized that a lot of our black pastors were totally underpaid. We, uh, if I took 10 families in that particular church and look at their average income, According to the Bible, if they were tithing, they would be able to help their pastor to live about on the same level that they are living. And the other families could pay the rent or whatever needed to, to, to be paid. I have spoken to church board secretaries and especially church board treasurers. And I'm sorry to say, most of the time, the treasurer was the biggest problem. They were either not tithing themselves or they thought it was their money and they handled it in a personal way. They would not help me to raise the pastor's income. I had to fight with them almost um, to try and persuade them that if you would exchange the roles and become a pastor, you would not be able to survive. And they were earning very good salaries. So I'm sorry, but I, I think that if we look at pastors, uh, they have my sympathy if they cannot get out of them. And by the way, uh, on our district, they also talk about the men's as the as the The, 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 the church mission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will move to the next issue. You know, these are just issues that you can continue to discuss. But we will go to the next uh, issue. And, uh, yeah, Pastor Paul. The question is... Uh, Some local church properties are being hijacked by intruders, even fellow Christians like pastors. What role is played by the districts 
strong region to condemn this spirit? That's the question. My response is, uh, this is a very regrettable situation. It is regrettable. This shouldn't be happening because those properties belong to the church of the Nazarene and in this case, the local church. The local church should put a, a mechanism in place to ensure that this practice doesn't happen. The manual talks of uh, the trustees of a local church. Their job is to take care of uh, the properties of the local churches, like the personage and other properties acquired by the local church. Also, the district properties board works with the local properties board to ensure that uh, church properties are not abused. It is regrettable that in some cases things happen in a wrong way, very negative way. But uh, my advice would be the, for the local church trustees and the district properties um, trustees to ensure that uh, this abuse is eliminated as soon as possible. Those properties are there to continue the mission of the Church of the Nazarene. There will be pastors who come after us. We are not the first and the last. Other pastors will come who will be needing those same properties in order to continue the mission of the Church of the Nazarene. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, now we will ask, uh, yeah, Reverend Don. Don, that was the question on, what was your question, Don? Okay, that was just a point. On? Lots of, okay, we, he, he will just comment on this point and then you can start your question. Just to add to what uh, Reverend Tambo said, it is important that both the local uh, churches and the properties board make sure that they acquire the necessary legal documents, uh, the title deeds, and they keep them safe. That's how you protect the property. Otherwise, if you don't do that, someone will do it. Like in some cases, some, somebody faking to be uh, on, mandated by the church or the advisory board just to hijack the, the, the building. Thank you. Don? All right, uh, this question is uh, re re referencing Article 13, uh, the Lord's Supper. Um, and uh, here, I'll read it to you. Uh, this says a quotation from Article 13, the Lord's Supper. Quote, it being the communion feast, on, only, and they have underscored only, those who have faith in Christ and love for the saints should be called to participate. End quote. Question is, is communion not a means of grace? Is it not the Lord's table? And then a quotation from Matthew chapter 26 drink from it all of you with the words of Jesus and then uh, they have parenthetically added including Judas who betrayed and Peter who denied uh, it's a good question yes there is the Lord's table yes it is a means of grace um, it, it depends on what your your understanding is uh, by the term means of grace uh, the, I understand the term means of grace, and I think I understand the manual's perspec perspective of means of grace is anything that brings you uh, closer into connection with God and the Holy Spirit. It, it brings you into intersection with God so that he can, he can work in your life. If you mean the means of grace as, uh, to, to mean that it is the means of salvation, then I would disagree strongly uh, because that is not what Jesus taught about communion. 
and uh, it is a remembrance. If we read the, the, the rest of the article, which I have in the manual here, it is, it is, a, uh, it, it is to be done uh, distinctly for those who are prepared for reverent appreciation of its significance. And by it, they show forth the Lord's death till he comes. It being the communion feast, only those who have faith in Christ and love for the saints should be called to participate therein. In other words, that they are believers. And uh, I don't think that, uh, let me put it in positive terms, I believe that it was intended for those who are followers of Christ, uh, not those who are not followers of Christ. Open table. Okay. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, we will just, there is one question here that is a, on judicial matter. That, is the, that will be the last question we'll take on that issue. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, our, our general secretary here. I will read it, and Dr. Wilson will answer. And after that, Stefan will answer his uh, one question. When you declare a church as a church in crisis, in keeping with manual paragraph 125.1, and you terminate the pastor-church relationship, does that amount to discipline, disciplinary action? If yet, if yet, yes. if yes, yeah, the reading, I mean, uh, if yes, can it be appealed against? And what is the procedure? Yeah. <laughs> the answer is no, it is not a disciplinary process. A disciplinary process requires for there to be accusations and for those accu accusations to be evaluated. There, the purpose of church in crisis is when the church has been deteriorating significantly, when there's low morale, when the finances have, been, have, not, have just been uh, to a point where the church cannot continue to function as it did, and there is a need for intervention by the district, for the district superintendent, the district advisory board, to have an opportunity to look at that situation. Now, the manual calls for there to be an, op an opportunity for, uh, as I said, intervention. But if intervention does not result in change, at that point, the pastor may be removed, the district uh, or the uh, church board may be, may, may be removed, and the district can step in and can seek to aid. But specifically, it is not a disciplinary process against the pastor. It may be that there just is um, uh, not a good fit, not a good match. You might have a good pastor, you may have a good church, but it's not a good match, and that need, there need to, needs to be removal. Once again, third time I'll say it, it is not a disciplinary issue. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Now we're going to turn to Stefan to answer the question. We have 10 minutes left, and uh, there will be three more questions that we are going to address. So, Stefan, please go ahead. The question I have is, why don't we speak in tongues? An easy one. <laughs> it's what we call a loaded question. You have a historical part, if some people are interested in how the speaking in tongues has been, understanding of the 20th century speaking in tongues has developed, we could speak of uh, the, the beginning of the Pentecostal, Pentecostal churches, like the Pentecostal church of the Nazarene, for those who don't know it was a part of our name, how you have different understandings which have evolved, which have led the church of the Nazarene quite importantly about the importance of sanctification, which was challenged by the people on the side of emphasizing speaking in tongues, to have a stance rather strong. It was clari clarified in 1976 in the Church of Nazarene, there was a statement. If some people among you would like the historical development, I have not the time to speak about it, but I would love to speak, spend time with you after this, if it's your interest. If your interest is about the gift of the Spirit, to see the Lord work in your churches, I would say read again 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. The heart of this text is about love. Love is the heart to develop 
the gift of the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God, the love of God is shed in our lives by the Holy Spirit which is given to us. And as you experience the peace and the love of God, ask for the most excellent gifts. What is the gift that Paul encourages us to seek? Prophecy. What is prophecy? It's one gift that every Christian is supposed to develop. Joel said, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That is the text Paul used at the moment of the, the Pentecost. Because prophecy is about hearing clearly God and communicating his will to others. If you want to see the gift of the Spirit spread in your life, begin with the love of God. And ask God to teach you to speak with him. For those who have not realized, I've gave, given a seminar on prophecy yesterday. But I use another word. I don't like to use prophecy. I said, who wants to learn to listen to the voice of God? Who took part of this, uh, in this uh, workshop? Could you raise the hand? Did you know you were in a workshop on learning to develop by the grace of God the gift of prophecy? The challenge we have is pride. I'm a prophet. I speak in the name of God. My brothers, my sisters, God wants you to learn to hear his voice and to speak, but not to be proud. Yes. That would my, be my response. And if you want more detail, please come to speak with me at the end of the time. Thank you, Brother Stefan. So uh, we're moving now to Reverend Mashangu. Yes. I'm, I'm supposed to answer one question. But for the sake of Mkulu, uh, Mkulu made a, a submission here. He says, uh, by Mkulu I mean Dr. Letzuel. Uh, the words he's quoting from the manual. This is from the burial ritual for a child in our manual. The words, may he, this quote, may he receive their de this dear one unto himself, close quote. This implied that the child who died some days ago is still with us at the time of the burial. Dr. Letzuele says, I will be happy with the following wedding. Uh, quote, he has already received these dear ones unto himself, close quote. That's not a question, it's just a statement. The question that I have to address is, where do church universities and hospitals account for finances? They only report progress. Well, um, the, we have in the college and the hospital set up, we have the board of trustees that has been elected uh, at the district assemblies. They account annually to the board of trustees and on top of that their books have to be audited before they even give that report thank you uh we continue with uh, dr chambo did you say only one <laughs> uh, yeah the other one is just a comment I think this is a great suggestion in relation to the first conversation we had about the pastors leaving the church. Someone said, do exit interviews with all those who resign so you will get the reasons and begin to have develop a sense of uh, what is happening. And I can help to suggest a design question to be included in their exit questionnaire. Uh, we, we, will, we will appreciate this help, uh, Sister Zanel. I um, think that's, um, that's, that's, yeah. Okay, the, the other one says, we love the regional conference. Does anyone have an idea when is the next one? Um, no, yeah. <laughs> ask, ask me that question next week. <laughs> no, we all love regional conference. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to come together and realize that we are one family. 
in principle, the regional conference has to happen the second year after the General Assembly. So uh, we, we're having one now, and in 2017, we're going to General Assembly, so we can begin to expect that in four years from now, we will have the next, uh, the next general, uh, the next regional conference. I would, I would like, but this, you also know you have field conferences, so we continuously find other ways to come together. Um, this one, I would like to read to the regional office team and everyone who was involved in preparing the conference. It says, I would like to appreciate the regional leadership for this conference and I would like to see more of these conferences in the future. So uh, thank you, thank you so much. Now to the question. Africa is plagued with a lot of injustices. Injustices towards women, children, homosexuals, etc., racial. What is the church in Africa doing? What can the church in Africa do to counter this trend? Um, that is now becoming a cultural norm. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the first, uh, the, there's, there are so many things that we are still learning. We have not really arrived. As a, as a church, we, we are still learning how to respond to those challenges, injustices that we have in our societies and in our communities. Uh, we encourage the local churches, the districts to participate. We know districts and local churches that have several programs. It might be child development to help bring the children into that center and, and help them through a specific time. Uh, we know of, uh, through in partnership with Compassionate Ministry, we have gender-based violence uh, ministries uh, that it's an attempt to respond to those issues. Uh, recently, we have appointed uh, uh, Stephen Phillips at the regional office to help us study and work with different organizations in learning what can we do in participating in, res in our a response to the human trafficking issues. Um, so, we, uh, through education and clergy development, with a think tank, uh, we, had a, we have a team, and Dr. Dre Crawford has been leading this team, working together in researching on the various issues as responses to the challenges that we have, including this very issue of uh, homosexuality that's presented here. And, and this afternoon we will have a workshop. It's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, entitled homosexuality, but it has to do with our sexuality and our relationship with God. Uh, all of this is an attempt of the church to respond uh, to these various issues. Have we arrived? Do we know all the answers? No. We, we still make a lot of mistakes, and sometimes we miss it. We, we don't always uh, have the, the right answers, but the truth is that we are committed and we are in a journey, and we encourage the local churches, the districts, to be involved in seeking or, or God's guidance on how to respond to those issues in their, in their own community and partner with NCM education, clergy development, and others as we learn, we learn together. Thank you. To Chambo, we just have now, I mean, I, we just have one question that came under, I mean, one topic that came uh, under three different questions. So we, ask, uh, we asked uh, Dr. Wilson to answer that one, and that will be the last. We just want to, uh, we are sorry for, there are many questions here that are waiting, and Dr. Chambo will explain later what we are going to do with this. But we'll just first listen to Dr. Wilson. Thank you. This question has to do with divorce and remarriage and also the stand of the church on polygamy. Uh, I'll answer the last question first, and that is that the church is not in agreement with uh, uh, polygamy, and there may be something that one of you would like to add to that that is not something that's part of my immediate context, but I do know that the church is not supportive of uh, polygamy with more than one spouse at a time. 
With regard to divorce and remarriage, I'll answer that question. Uh, first of all, you can look in paragraphs 30.2 and those that are following, actually paragraph 30 uh, and the paragraphs that follow in the manual because there's more information than I can give and I don't want to read it to you. So I'll try to summarize it as best I can. And I'll try to do that in three parts. Number one, that, that we have a responsibility as the church and as pastors of congregations to give instruction with regard to the, the, the meaning of marriage and, the mo and what, what marriage should be and how that it should function in the church and in society. And it's critical, first of all, that we help our people to understand that and what marriage is from a biblical perspective. Uh, the second part of this, then, is uh, that we believe that marriage is between one man and one woman for a lifetime. That is what we believe the Bible teaches. That is the, that is the standard that is there, biblically, theologically. That's the standard that is there. The third way, the third response that I would give to that is that even though this is the standard and our manual in a couple of different places recognizes that there are times when, when uh, the standard is not obtainable. It is not able to be obtained. And so because of that, we believe that there is redemptive action. We don't believe that divorce is the unforgivable sin. We believe that God can redeem individuals who have been in divorce situations. Sometimes there is marital unfaithfulness. When, and that is, if you look at the strict interpretation, if you want to be real strict about it, that is what, the, that is what Jesus said. He talked about uh, that mar divorce and marriage with regard to someone who, where there has been marital unfaithfulness. Uh, uh, there are also situations where a person is the innocent party. When they do not want the divorce and it is thrust upon them, as our manual says. And we recognize that even in those situations, that there can be redemptive action taken, that God can bring restoration to the individual. When it comes to members of the clergy, uh, there is a recognition, first of all, that before a person is ordained, that divorce is a barrier that needs to be removed, needs to be evaluated by the district advisory board, by the credentials board, and uh, for there to be action taken and then given to the board of general superintendents. When divorce has occurred, when there is an ordained minister, there is very clear instruction given in the manual as to how there is to be a response. Uh, when a minister knows, an ordained minister knows that they, have, they are facing separation, that they are facing divorce, then they need to be in concert with their district superintendent and their district advisory board. The district advisory board needs to interview that pastor, talk with that pastor, discover what the situation is, why uh, the divorce is going to occur, and then they determine whether or not that pastor is able to continue in their assignment in ministry. Uh, but there needs to be strong communication between the pastor and the district superintendent and district advisory board when there is separation leading to divorce. I've tried to cover the broad topic very quickly, and once again, I'm willing to talk to others if need be. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. And as you said, if uh, those who are, want to go deeper, they can go and see him, and he can explain more. Well, I would like to, for us to express our appreciation to the Field Strategy Coordinators team for facilitating this uh, time of our conversation. Let's put our hands together for, thank you.